But there's something about Van Gogh's legacy which is much more important than his fathering this or that ism of modern art. Vincent's passionate belief was that people wouldn't just see his pictures, but feel the rush of life in them. Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science. This is episode two in the series of three episodes on exploring Arles. And this is obviously just taking you through my visit to Arles. I think I arrived on the 11th of May 2019 and then I think I left on the 14th or the 15th. So I was there three days, uh, packed a heck of a lot into a very short time as you're about to see. By the way, the video clip that you saw right at the beginning that that brief little clip of the grass that was actually shot in all and and i'm going to start with that i'm going to take you through that um that scene is going to be what we're going to sort of open with today before we get to that let's start off with a little bit of orientation so where exactly is all and um I provided a couple of maps here. You can see that the Camargue is kind of a vast area that's kind of like a swampy marsh area along the coast, uh, famous for its horses, the wild horses of the Camargue. That area is south of Arles. The funny thing about Arles is it's kind of along the coast, except you just never see the coast. Um, and it's also a very flat area and yet the sort of mountains just to the north of all heading to saint Rami, and that's going to be part of the story in part three believe me so anyway you kind of get a triangle of places that that you should bear in mind the one is all the other one is saint Rami to the the north and slightly to the east and then there's nimes which is that interesting little town also very old town, as old as all, if not older, also has a, a Roman amphitheater, and that's slightly to the west. Now you can see why I had to change trains, because old, old is kind of off the beaten track, literally. Although if you stayed, if you stayed on the train in Nimes, it would eventually take you to uh, Marseille, right? So if we look at this last map here, we see a, you can kind of see where I was staying in terms of um, the station. So the station is kind of at the top of the map, circled in with a little pink circle, where it says SNCF, right? And you can see it's quite close to the um, the, the the river, the the Rhone, and one of the first places you walk past is what used to be the yellow house I mean it's literally right next to the station and we're going to deal with the yellow house right at the end of this episode anyway if you had to walk basically in a straight line from the station almost a straight line slightly slightly to the, slightly to the left slightly to the west um, then you would cross through the center of all which is what I did and then you go across another canal and that was where I was staying. So you can see there's a dark highway and then there's a canal that is going parallel to the dark highway and I was right next to a little bridge that was crossing over the highway and the canal, right? And it's kind of because of that highway that I was a little bit um, thrown off where I was because the highway kind of made it feel like that that was the the city limits put it that way and because of the nature of highways it's just difficult to navigate when there's the big highway where you can't sort of you know it's it's, it's almost like a river uh, it's difficult to get from the one side to the other and you, you don't really want to commit to a particular side if, if you don't know for sure you're going to go there but anyway that was where i was staying and um if you 
and and basically I was staying very close to a painting that Van Gogh painted which is further down the canal and, and that's where we're going to go in this narrative but in terms of real time I think I only went there on the second day so I think it was May 12th I went to the bridge at Lang, Langwa, Langwa not quite sure if I'm pronouncing it right Long Loire, something like that. Okay, so that was um, taking a, a walk kind of along that pond called Pont Van Gogh. And as I said, I was, I was living in a little house or a little room in a, in a house along this canal. And if you followed the canal further, you came to the Long Loire Bridge, which was painted by Van Gogh in March 1888. He arrived in all around about a month earlier, arrived in February, February 20th or so, 1888. And so about a month later, he was painting this bridge. And um, so very early on, he was in that area. And so obviously, so was I. I was also which is one of the early areas that I went to check out. And um, for those who've followed this channel, who have uh, listened to my coverage of the movie, uh, especially um, At Eternity's Gate, you may remember that I kind of criticized the director for just being really, really bad at trying to represent some of the scenes Van Gogh painted. The very first one in the Yellow House, he did really, really well. But the scenes w where you sort of have it half blurred out and he's sort of standing between reeds, I thought it was done incredibly badly. And, um, you know, you might say, well, well, could you have done any better? Well, I think I think I have here. I think um, the just the capturing of the, the grass is blowing in the in the wind, in the mistral. And that was something that was interestingly very present um, around me was was how this wind was blowing and it's not just a breeze you're sort of kind of aware of the of the mistral and sometimes it's um, it, it I, w I wouldn't say it's ever pleasant so it's not like a pleasant breeze it's kind of something that you notice you notice the winds blowing but then sometimes it is definitely unpleasant, uh, especially at night. It is kind of a nagging, haunting, kind of annoying wind. Um, it's definitely a, a, a character of all, and it certainly gives all character. So, you know, I, I um, because I've got a bit of a background in photography, I'm, I am quite sensitive to things like light and getting the scenes and proportions right. And um, I have, um, I do have experience uh, as a photojournalist writing about lot, lots of artists. I've written th about 13 long form features in a South African magazine called Country Life on master artists, uh, including Dutch masters, including my great grandfather. So doing this was sort of natural for me. Um, it was work, I guess, but it, it was certainly something I really enjoyed doing. Um, I really enjoy combining writing with photography and if it's with art, even more so. Just for me, said that um, most, well, a lot of my, my audience certainly don't seem to be interested in that at this point anyway. So hopefully the art crowd will find their way to me, but, but more than likely they just can't understand why what Van Gogh has got to do with true crime. Interestingly, in the book At Eternity's Gate, there's a ledger that features in that that I, I believe is, is a fake. I believe it's it's um, not not actually Van Gogh's ledger. And, and, and I kind of think the movie was set up to almost as a PR campaign to sell that ledger. Because obviously anything that is assumed to be by Van Gogh suddenly becomes worth millions right so anything any document or sketch or drawing whatever that is assumed to be by van gogh 
is suddenly worth millions and you can become a millionaire just by getting an expert to authenticate something. And the Van Gogh Museum don't believe that that sketchbook is true and I don't either. So we'll deal with it with a sketch from that sketchbook a little bit later on. Just a quick uh, note on enunciation or I guess pronunciation. Uh, the Americans say Van Gogh, the British say Van Gogh, like almost like coughing. The French say Van Gogh and the correct way to pronounce Van Gogh's name is obviously the way Van Gogh would say it, which is the, the Dutch pronunciation. So almost the way you'd say cough, um, except ex not with an F, but with a kind of a slight ch sound. So you'd say Van Gogh, not Van and not Fun, um, Fun, Van Gogh. That's how you'd say it. Anyway, I'm sure everyone has their own unique ways that they want to say it and how they know it. But I think the best way to say someone's name is the way the person whose name it belongs to says their name. Wouldn't you agree? I do think the fact that Van Gogh's name, just the pronunciation of his name is so variable, tells you a little about the story about Van Gogh, which is people put, <laughs> people um, say his name in the same way that they think about him. It's it's with their own, they put their own little slant on it, but that is not necessarily the truth of the person or, you know, who that person really was and how he really was, right? So this brings us to Rue de Alichon. I'm, I'm really not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, I'm really bad at pronouncing the French place names. Uh, but anyway, it is the avenue of trees that leads to sort of a Roman, ancient Roman graveyard. And this was an area where Van Gogh and Paul Gauguin um, painted together and came up with totally different depictions. Now, I have done an episode on that uh, earlier, so I'm not going to go into, into too much detail, but here you can kind of see what that... Um, avenue look like and the trees are still there uh, one thing that I thought was sort of missing from Van Gogh's depictions of it were, were the shadows of the trees but maybe he painted it on a day that where the sun wasn't shining I don't know if I believe that because there's definitely a picture where it looks like there is blue sky and it looks quite bright so maybe just didn't like painting shadows. Certainly the photos one takes, you see the shadows pretty clearly, sort of lacing the, the, the avenue. And then what's really interesting is that the one end of the avenue is this sort of um, Roman structure or mausoleum kind of building. And then that is where you, you have these sort of Roman tombs and it's sort of a kind of a labyrinth. And that is where at Eternity's Gate formed that scene both inside the structure and outside, immediately outside, where Gorgard tells Vincent, you know, I can't stay here anymore. I need to, I, I can't be here anymore. And Vincent is very upset by this and he, he actually feels abandoned and betrayed and very hurt. And, and the director then uses this moment to show him losing touch with reality and kind of ha having almost like, like an episode where he hears voices and he loses track of time. Very over dramatic. I don't think it was done very well. Um, I, I don't really like the depictions of Van Gogh as the, the mad artist just because I don't think people understand that side of him. I really don't know why the director of at Eternity's Gate didn't spend more time having just sort of depicting both artists in this area, painting the same scene, interacting, disagreeing, um, sharing how they see things in a different way. I think that would have been fascinating to do. But I think you need to really understand art and the artist to know how those conversations would have gone. And I think it would be fascinating to most people to see the same scene in real life on camera 
and then these actors pretending to be these characters and then how they're interpreting it, are they seeing it in a totally different way? And that's another thing that I think the At Eternity's Gate could have done more of, is just put Van Gogh in real scenes, in, in reality, where that he was painting. And he just, I think they did maybe one or two or three. And I just found it very weak. Um, he could have put far more effort into those kind of executions, but he, he seemed to prefer this idea of long monologues and long um, sort of fuzzy scenes with piano keys clinking away, which I think is a very weak way of uh, representing something that was pretty easy to do, and people would have loved it, I think. So let me talk to you a bit more directly about what I experienced when I was there. Um, so let's go to the amphitheater. Now what's amazing about this amphitheater was how hard it was to photograph. I mean it is not only very big in terms of um, phys uh, physical height or vertical height, but it's also you know a, a very big structure in terms of its girth. And so it was really hard to find a place to, to photograph it where you, you kind of going to see what you're dealing with. And it was almost like you would back away from the structure and then you would back almost into a cafe. And then you'd walk forward and then the top of the amphitheater would be cut off by the, you know, the, the edge of one's uh, viewfinder in the lens or if not the top then the bottom and so it was very difficult to actually fit this massive amphitheater into into the camera and uh, it was totally different when you were inside it then you got kind of a different view and of course this was a uh, um, scene that van gogh himself painted the inside of this sort of bull i think they used it for uh, bullfighting so Les Arènes, uh, I'm not so <laughs> sure if I'm pronouncing it right, uh, but that is the arena or the amphitheater. That was actually painted also in 1888, so just a couple of months uh, after Van Gogh's arrival in Arles. Uh, it was painted around about November or December 1888. It was actually painted also while Gorgar was around, so, so they apparently went to this together. What I find kind of weird is is how boring Van Gogh's painting is of this arena. Instead of painting the point of it, you know, the, the spectacle going on in the ring, his painting is is sort of just focusing on the crowd um, and and nothing in particular. It's just sort of a jumble of people, and I, I really don't think it's a particularly good um, execution. I think Van Gogh has his moments, and this definitely wasn't one of them. Having said that, when you're in this arena, you really hear the wind. You really get a sense of something almost alien. You, you feel like you are stepping through history, because something like this is very different to what we know in the Western world in terms of we used to stadiums, but they don't look like this. They don't feel like this. They're not built of stone. Um, they don't have ancient buildings around them. The stadiums we know tend to be new, tend to have lots of plastic seats and a green grassy pitch in the middle. And, and this is definitely something that feels alien. I mean, it's not as though it's brand new to us, but it, it's nevertheless very, very different. I mean, the area in the middle isn't even a rectangle, it's kind of an oval. And the history of this amphitheater is even more intriguing. And the history is the amphitheater was built and, and the, the, you sort of had your gladiatorial um, events there and obviously a lot of blood was shed and animals were brought here and you know the crowd was entertained and then that gave way to much later to m man versus um, bull, right? Bull contest, matadors and that kind of thing. 
But between those two extremes of history, there was a time where all was kind of under siege. And I'm not going to go into the history into too much detail, but this is where history itself can be kind of like fake news. And what I mean is, what, when you see this amphitheater, you see kind of this empty bowl. And you think, oh, this is what it was like, or this is, this is the amphitheater. But what the history actually shows is that at various times, this amphitheater served as a fortress. So in other words, as history changed and as the tides of history changed, there was actually a time where all was kind of under siege and people started retreating inside this amphitheater, building their shops and homes and um, businesses, you know, inside this amphitheater. And so eventually the amphitheater came to resemble like a castle, like a giant fortress, just full of people, because people were trying to um, seek shelter and seek security inside the structure and so it became this fortress as i say filled with a jumble of buildings which were then subsequently um, cut out so in other words you had the amphitheater you, then you had a jumble of buildings inside it and then they and then they kind of got rid of the buildings that were subsequently built and then so what you then see is the history that predated the that horrible period of of where, where people were under siege right and it's when you see something like that that you realize well the history of this little place that seems quite quaint and cute is actually has moments of savagery and tragedy and devastation and so that scenario that played out in this arena in terms of a whole community hiding inside this arena speaks a little bit of Van Gogh himself persona that that whole legacy of suffering um, reduced to a single person who then cuts off his ear or his ear is cut off and I mean he seeks refuge in this yellow house and then he's ultimately kicked out of it, just as the, the people who were in this arena were, were later, um, well, they had to have been evicted because look at what it looks like now. So for me, the interesting thing with this arena is just how some things that you see misrepresent history. You think what you're seeing is this, you're just looking straight back in time like an uninterrupted long view back in time but actually it's not it's not as simple or as um, peaceful or as calm as it seems if that makes sense so from there I'm going to take you to the garden in all that Van Gogh painted this was a pretty difficult photo to take simply because what you can't see is that, that there was actually a gate across from so right in if I'd lowered the camera a little bit more and zoomed out a little bit more you would have seen a gate across that path or that road with a with a lock on it and that would have made a terrible picture so I do try and find a way to make it look like there was no gate and it's not incredibly good picture but I think it does somewhat represent the original certainly what you can see is just the trees on either side and the basic sort of curve of the road once again Van Gogh doesn't paint any shadows do you notice or if they there that they're very slight shadows so the next um, couple of pictures I'm going to show you are from a structure I'm, I'm not 100% sure what it was but this was the first thing that I saw um, on the first day that I went out. So even before I actually saw that bridge at Lang Langlois. Um, and what you're seeing is there's, there's a part, there's a, there's a section where the, the rock becomes man-made, a man-made wall, but which is also extremely old. And then another man-made wall that is less old is built on top of that. And 
they almost seem to be it all, you it, you almost get a sense of rock turning into a wall just almost like magically and again coming from somewhere that's where nothing is very old seeing something like this and where nature's sort of taken taking it over quite in quite a beautiful way um i don't know i found it quite fascinating quite beautiful and and france is full of buildings like this in part three i'm going to take you to a pretty impressive citadel or, or monastery something that sort of belongs in game of thrones uh, i'm going to take you uh, through that but um, obviously all is just full of very old buildings statues very ornamental things even the fountains drinking fountains are in the shape of ducks or, or, or swans uh, heads where the water comes out of its, its beak and it's just all um, pretty amazing uh, everything is old and even the new things are, are sort of made to look old and that kind of is the fake news of some of these old old places even the new places are pretending to be old if that makes sense and you, you only notice that after the original um what's the word the original rush of what you see kind of as past you start seeing some of the the, the deceit if that's the word so the bridge at Trincote <laughs> is um, also, it was also painted in 1888. And the bridge itself was situated where there was once a middle age fortification, uh, Trincote Castle, which was raised to the ground in 1161. So you know again when you when you see an old place and you think wow it's it's really it's really cute it's really quaint it's really uh sweet you are not seeing the full picture you are seeing something that has been put on top of something else you are you are not seeing the people who have disappeared who've been destroyed who've been displaced who've disappeared and the same kind of applies to the the art left behind by artists you are seeing the artwork you're not really looking behind the oil or underneath the oil to the blood sweat and tears the the actual person that left this behind you seeing what you want to see right the same in a way with writers as well you read their words you don't really think much about how they came about what went into putting them together and so it's very difficult when you're walking through all not to gravitate um, into the the center. It, it, you just seem to be constantly drawn into all. You know, if, even if you're trying to stay on the periphery. And so I ended up wandering or stumbling upon the night cafe a couple of times, and. It's strange um, that's such a familiar sort of artwork. I didn't really, I felt really weird going inside. It, it just felt like, it felt weird. It felt like you're stepping inside history except you're not because it's an actual restaurant. And um, when you go upstairs, there's a pool table. And uh, it's, you know, obviously not the same pool table as the one that Van Gogh painted, but it, it is, you know, representing that. So in a weird way, you know, you're in the right place, but the walls around you have changed, the paint has changed, the people have changed, and some of what is there is actually kind of a mock, a, a, a mockery of what you're seeing. So what I would later see when I was in auvers sur which w was where Vincent lived the last time of his life. You'd see, for example, a bed inside and a chair. Well, that isn't the original bed or chair. It's just meant to represent that, if that makes sense. So I mentioned earlier that the Mistral is something that is a real character in all. And so I'm going to play you just a couple of clips where you can actually hear the wind at night. 
It's especially at night that the wind is a character and it, it definitely makes it feel desolate. You feel like history is sort of tearing at you, but in a kind of an unpleasant way. It's as if it is, there's a disquiet, right? And I was there in mid-May and the wind was cold. I mean, you, you had to wear kind of a hoodie and you had to wear something warm. Otherwise, you'd get pretty cold. And so in my diary, I wrote that the Mistral sounds like a TGV moving by, that it sounds like a train. And there were different sounds of it. Sometimes you'd hear it through the leaves of a tree sometimes between buildings but it was often like a roar often it would be a loud sound almost like the sea with a with a kind of an ominous undertone it wasn't like i said it was never really a pleasant breeze it was often a stronger um, presence than that and that is why i think the director of at eternity's gate did really well starting his film with that it wasn't right at the beginning but it was near the beginning where you see van gogh in the yellow house and the, the shutters are banging and you hear the wind and there's the rattle of the trees outside Th that i thought was excellent but the rest i don't think was done very well so a movie that was showing in all that I noticed, I just noticed the poster was The Dead Don't Die and after spending the day looking at history and history pretending to be history or um, certain sites pretending to be certain things unless you look closer um, you had this weird sense that the dead don't die but what they reborn as how they reborn isn't necessarily accurate what you're seeing isn't real even when you think you're looking at history you've got to look very closely to 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 know what is real and what is true because all of us want to see what we want to see and tourism works like that as well they're trying to sell you what you want to see what is popular Okay, and this brings us to the St. Paul Asylum. And uh, this is the hospital where Van Gogh went following the ear incident. So he went there to recover. And it's very easy to recognize from the idiosyncratic yellow arches. And I think it's got like a blue roof. So there's this sort of interplay between yellow and blue. And obviously the tourist authorities have kept to that color code for you know 130 years or they've they've, they've um, if the, the color did change that they repainted it to the original uh, in, in terms of the original that Van Gogh represented when he painted it so what's interesting is Van Gogh was hospitalized in all twice um, the first one was I think to the hospital of St. Paul which is known as an asylum. In those days, hospitals were called asylums. These days, an asylum is typically associated with being an insane asylum, but then an asylum was a hospital. And then the other one was the asylum of saint Rami, which was further away. And that was something I'll deal with in the next uh, episode, part three in this series. Like the amphitheater this hospital was very difficult to photograph it was difficult to represent the same scene that van gogh had painted um, the trees are a little bit different the, the trees are there but it's difficult to orientate oneself because the trees are different they, they are of a different size they, they are more trees in some cases in other cases um, sometimes the trees present where there shouldn't be any for example at the bridge that I mentioned earlier and in other cases um, there are no trees where he has painted trees while he was at the hospital Van Gogh wrote sometimes moods of indescribable anguish sometimes moments when the veil of time 
and fatality of circumstances seemed to be torn apart for an instant. And it was in May 1889, so around about this time that we're in now, 131 years ago, uh, that Van Gogh um, left all and he traveled to the asylum and then he stayed there for approximately a year. So for a year he was kind of under lockdown. Just a quick note on the ear, if you go to the Wikipedia page dealing with the hospital in all, there's an art historian, Rita Wildegans, who's quoted saying, all the witnesses from all said that Van Gogh had removed his entire left ear. I think this is also very misleading, is, you know, what they're actually saying there is Van Gogh's entire ear was missing, but the way it's written is, he removed the entire left ear. They aren't witnesses to that. They aren't witnesses to him seeing him cut off his ear. In, so what they witnesses to is the fact that he was missing his entire ear. Now, you can, if we deal with the ear just for a second, you can say, well, does the fact that more of the ear is missing mean that someone else cut off his ear or that he did? And if is the more of the and is the more of the ear that is removed, does that mean he was more mad? So if he cut off a small piece of his ear, he was a little bit mad. If he cut off a medium size of ear, he was medium mad. And if he cut off all of his ear, he was very mad. Is that how it works? Or is it more likely that the entire ear was cut off because someone sliced at his head with a, with a sword or with a, with a sharp knife, but more likely a sword? And did his roommate, did his housemate own a sword? Yes, he did. I got lost quite a few times when I was in all. It was actually incredible how often I got lost given how small it is. And it's incredible how far I walked occasionally because I, I just couldn't find my way. Now, you might think, well, how can you get lost when you've got your phone and all that? I kind of made a pact with myself when I went to, to France. It was just that I didn't want to I didn't want to be with my phone everywhere. I didn't want to sort of run around Instagramming and taking photos. Even though I had my camera and my phone, I kind of, I didn't want to make that what the whole trip was about. So... I kind of, even though there are a lot of photos that you see, I kind of spend quite a lot of time looking, absorbing, and experiencing. And I didn't really want to be Googling or um, Google mapping or anything like that. I kind of wanted to experience it the way you would, you know, if you were Van Gogh, you know, walking around, not knowing where to go when you got there, looking at maps and that kind of thing. And um, I kind of kept to that even beyond all and sometimes maybe stupidly so but you certainly have an interesting experience when you do get lost um, I think that's one of the sad aspects of life today is, is you don't get lost you don't you don't feel fear and you, you're so familiar with everything that that it's kind of kind of a little bit um, a little bit dull you know where to go, you go there, you see what you want to see, and you come back. And you don't realize what is, you know, sometimes difficult to see and what you're missing. You don't realize what you wanted to see or could have seen by, by stumbling upon it, right? And everyone ends up going where everyone else ends up going as well. So everyone gets the same stock standard cliched experience of a place and, and I didn't want that. One thing I noticed in all that was kind of different was the the crows and the ravens. Also I noticed them in Paris and also in Auvers Souwa. So um I didn't I was pertinently looking out for, for ravens in Portugal and I, I may have seen one. I, I really didn't see many, but I, um, I saw plenty in France, which is quite interesting. So I also went to see uh, the Roman baths in all. I, I actually used to live in Bath in England, so that had some significance for me. And then 
and then let's go to the yellow house and um, to me what is really interesting with the yellow house is that is the scene of the crime in terms of Van Gogh in all you know if there was a a crime in in all to talk about in terms of Van Gogh it had to do with this ear incident and one of the things I wanted to do in all was retrace the route that Van Gogh took and I was kind of surprised that I couldn't for a couple of reasons the one reason is Van Gogh's house the the yellow house doesn't exist anymore it was bombed to smithereens and so the actual house has been demolished it was partially demolished by I think a World War II bomb but then they demolished the rest of it and so what is so ironic is the most signature aspect of Van Gogh in all is missing whereas everything else is there in in a way and I think that tells you a little about a, a bit about the I don't want to call it hypocrisy but the French when Van Gogh lived there didn't really like him and kind of turfed him out so that they, they treated him not in a very friendly or kind way and of course now he's, he's the big hero and he's the great celebrity but the fact that his yellow house is missing I think speaks to the hypocrisy and f I don't know I kind of identified a little bit with Van Gogh when I went home to my little small little room slept um, alone in my little room and heard the, the wind blasting outside as well and I could kind of identify with that thing of um, I mean, I'd also spent the whole day walking and taking photos by myself and um, just in my own little world and thinking about Van Gogh's, uh, you know, foot being foot sore and um, just thinking about, um, you know, kind of what he was going through and also that thing where you're surrounded by such beauty but it's also kind of misunderstood and there's a kind of a cruelty to it it's not just a beautiful building it is a building on the bones of somebody else and I, I don't know if Van Gogh thought about it or feared it but his whole um, life would, would be sort of sacrificed and, and a whole legacy would be built on his bones you know he, he didn't enjoy the fruits of his own work somebody else did other people did um, and so the yellow house is probably the hardest aspect to sort of capture in a way to, to say well this is a nice picture representing where Van Gogh lived and the only way I could do it was to get a couple of flowers in front and a tree on the other side and then have a little piece of a building which is where the yellow house was behind it uh, sticking out. What is interesting is behind the yellow house is um, a bridge, the railway bridge and I would cycle under that railway bridge on my way to saint um on my last day, actually my last afternoon in all. Uh, sorry, I just want to complete a point. So I've had very little sleep so I'm a little bit incoherent today but um, one thing that that I couldn't retrace was this the route that Van Gogh did after he cut off his ear so from the um, brothel to the yellow house what, what is the route and it was really weird I was in all I thought this was going to be very simple to to follow and I but I, I couldn't figure it out so then I contacted Bernadette Murphy who wrote the book um, Van Gogh's ear I contacted her on Twitter and I, I asked her you know how do you what what is the address like how do you get from a to b and but the bottom line is the th that part of the street grid was destroyed so you can't really connect the two because they don't really exist anymore and you know when you found something out like that you, you realize to what extent um the history we have today and, and trying to revisit it, it, it it's gone you can kind of imagine it but it's there are certain things that have been removed from the substrate of the planet and they unrecognizable and you can't really visit them anymore the way they were it just doesn't exist
And so I kind of want to end off with another kind of a magical moment. And I don't know if you've picked it up from this particular episode compared to the previous one. There was a strange, I had a bit of a change of heart um, as I spent more time in all. On the one hand, I was more and more charmed and intrigued. On the other hand, I was kind of appalled by the kind of the hypocrisy. In other words, Van Gogh was treated like a pariah. I mean, he was kicked out of all. Um, it wasn't quite as bad as that, but but he certainly wasn't accepted, and he didn't feel he didn't want to go back after his, he after he left. He he went all the way back to Paris, where he'd sort of come from. So you have that kind of hypocrisy of all now treating him like a like a hero, and he, you have sort of posters all over the place and exhibitions all over the place and Van Gogh's name all over the place. Meanwhile, when he actually lived there, um, th they couldn't have treated him worse. And I mean, look look at what ultimately happened to him. Whether he cut off his own ear or somebody else did, it's not a very nice way of treating a, a person, is it? <laughs> so, you know, if someone is so miserable somewhere that they cut off their own ear, it's not really showing that, that uh, he's been embraced by the public with open arms, is it? And so I did kind of have a, despite this sort of mixed feeling and this, this funny feeling about history, I did have kind of an interesting moment, quite a magical moment as well, where I went from the area where the Yellow House was supposed to be and I walked to this area where... Van Gogh painted the stars over the Rhone, which is kind of like a precursor to Starry Night, right? Um, and I kind of figured that it must be nearby if the Rhone is right there. And so I just wanted to see you know, how far is it if you walk from kind of his front door to where he painted this painting. And it was something like a two minute walk. It really wasn't far. And when I did that walk, um, it was at night and the wind was blowing really strongly and I was completely alone. In some places you would have tourists pitching up, but in crowds, it wouldn't just be one. You, you would have like a busload of Chinese tourists got off at that uh, Long, Long Loire Bridge and then that suddenly ruined, ruined everything. Once they got there, there was no point in being there anymore. And they were, every now and then you'd sort of have busloads of people coming, g getting off the bridge, taking a photo, getting back on the bridge, uh, getting back on the bus and then going off. That is like the most soulless way of, of seeing a place. And, and I was doing it the opposite. I was doing it by myself. Um, I wasn't even doing it. I wasn't like ticking off things off a map. I was kind of just thinking, well, where am I now? Okay, I think I'm going to go there. And it's not as though I didn't use a map, but I was also just going on intuition and on curiosity and on inspiration and on interest and, and going where the spirit led me. And so so this was quite a magical moment where, where I sort of stood where I thought the door to the entrance of the Yellow House was and then going to this area where he painted the stars over the Rhone. And... In, in a, in a, it was quite funny because, first of all, I didn't recognize what I was seeing as the stars over the road. Um, it just looked far more, it looked very dull, put it that way. Um, it didn't look as magical as Van Gogh had painted it. And then I thought, shouldn't I, and, and it didn't come out very nicely in a photo, it just looked very plain. And I didn't like it. I wanted a more glitzy sort of scene. And, and someone had taken a photo where there was a lot of pink light. And I thought, well, must I come here at sunset or sunrise and, and capture it where there's more vivid colors? And while I was sort of thinking about that, I was just standing there. And, and I suddenly got a completely different sense. I just got a sense of loneliness. Um... I was the only person there that the wind was blowing really hard. It was cold. And because of the distance that you could see and the, the light so far away, you felt quite lonely. And the fact that Van Gogh had painted these two figures seemed to be him saying, you know, he, he kind of wished 
I think that for himself, he wished he was in a relationship. He wished he was with someone. And so w when he depicts these characters, which, which I'm not sure if they were really there, maybe they were sometimes there, but um, I think he was sort of wishing for a shared experience with someone. And in a way, he was doing that with his art in the same way I was kind of doing it with my photos and writing. Um, trying to share some of these profound senses of time and place um, but sharing them in in the way of recording it to, to show to somebody else and so I think when I got home that night after that visit to the site we painted uh, stars over the river Rhone which is something he painted in eighteen in October eighteen eighty eight. So, very um, I think it was very shortly before Gorga arrived. Um, he painted this particular painting. Paul Gorga arrived in all in on the twenty third of October. So it was a couple of weeks after Vincent painted. The night, the, the stars over the the Rhone that that his friend arrived, and we know from his letters to Paul Gauguin that he was getting more and more lonely, sort of like almost begging him to come. You know, Paul Gauguin had said, "Well, I, I might join you. Okay, I'll probably join you." And then Vincent sort of prepared the house for him and and everything, and then, and then he just didn't arrive and. Van Gogh got more and more sort of worked up, like, you know, when are you coming? And there's something plaintive about the stars of the River Rhone, I think. It's in the dark, and it is him sitting there painting. And I think he's sort of pining for companionship. So when I went home from there, I wrote in my diary just that if you really want to understand Van Gogh, the, the key psychology is his loneliness and loneliness isn't madness loneliness isn't insanity but it can certainly make one feel like you're kind of going crazy as i think a lot of people are with this coronavirus being on your own for an extended 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 period of time is going to make you profoundly unhappy we social creatures we want to be with other people and so if you very 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 lonely um, that is going to give one a sense of anguish, but that's not insanity. That's actually normal. It's normal to feel unhappy about being constantly alone, right? Constantly lonely. And Van Gogh kind of tried to keep himself busy, and he did. But, you know, you can only do that for so long, and then the, the loneliness comes back and knocks at your door. And that's kind of like what the mistral in all kind of does is it seems to be constantly knocking and reminding you especially when you're traveling alone through there you notice this wind and it it whispers and it it makes noises and it says you know it's it talks to you but in a in a way that's kind of hard to handle hard to hard to bear it's almost like history knocking on your door saying talking about the dissatisfaction of the world and of the dead and of you know the ghosts that are out there and ultimately Van Gogh didn't solve his problem he didn't solve the problem of his loneliness he, he didn't live happily ever after and I guess the the other insight that I drew from my little trip to all was that when Van Gogh left his parents' home for the last time, it was on his terms. When he left Paris for all, and at that time he was sort of near his brother, it was also largely on his own terms. But in all, things changed. He did not leave all by choice. And his last journey to Auvers was conditional in significant respects. Okay, so this is almost 54 minutes long. I'm not going to take it further than that. In the next episode, I'm going to take you through an epic but very difficult um, mountain bike ride to saint Rami. Uh, there's something quite funny that happened in the middle of that 
uh, saga, so I'll share that with you. Um, coming next week, I'm going to be dealing with the disappearance of Madeleine McCann. Uh, that'll be on this channel. So if you're interested in that, please subscribe. On Patreon, I'm doing something completely new, uh, a Discord chat with some of the patrons where you are free to talk to me uh, instead of just messaging me and we can kind of have a conversation about certain true crime subjects. I'm also going to be putting up an audiobook excerpt onto this channel from the murder of Vincent van Gogh just to give you guys an idea of what is in that book. So that will be coming soon on this channel as well. Thank you for listening. Wherever you are, stay safe. Stay healthy, make sure you get enough sleep, and I'll see you guys next time.